Okay, so we are on Facebook. I am not the same. I am not the same. I say, Kiss, I'm so Okay, we are on Facebook now, so we should be good to go. Good evening, family. Good afternoon. Good morning to you. Depending on where you're listening to us tonight from, it's a blessing having you. We are glad to have our fathers with us tonight. It's going to be an amazing time. The chat room is always informative, educative. It's a place where we learn. There's always a lot of information being provided um, to us whenever we come here. We are learning. Um, I always say that I am nowhere saying I'm perfect. I am still learning. I'm building myself up through these various discussions and communications that are constantly held every week on our platform. We thank God for another awesome session of the chat room. I have with me great fathers, Apostle David, Judah, and Apostle Charles. It's going to be an awesome discussion. Please don't be left out. Invite a friend to invite a friend to invite a friend. This cut across, listen, the people of God, everyone can benefit from this. And I don't want you to be left out. Please come on board as we learn together. You already know your your submissions your inputs everything is welcome so please jump on board if you want to join us on zoom you are more than welcome and if you want to call in to also submit you know a comment or whatever it is um if you have a question or anything you can always dial 1-614-592-8351 that is 1-614-592-8351 and our fathers will be glad to give you any answers that you may need again invite a friend we are live you can share the broadcast please invite someone to come in as we are getting the ball rolling without wasting much time my name is Lady Mary Bordu. I am your host in the chat room, married to an awesome and a humble man of God whom I appreciate so much. And Papa, I'm going to ask you both to introduce yourself. Apostle David, for the benefit of those watching or seeing you on this platform for the first time, can you please introduce yourself for us and tell us a bit of what you're into and what you do? God bless you. Um, I was born... David Ajiman, now I go by David Judah. I'm the senior pastor for Vintage Grounds Church, Columbus, Ohio. And Mary is a wonderful um, member of Vintage Grounds Church. And I'll let you know, Pastor, not be upset, okay? Uh, <laughs> I consider myself uh, um, a prophetic teacher, uh, which means I'm able to reveal the hidden mysteries of God. And um, I'm an end time apostle that God is raising, like Paul said, um, the things that has been hidden from the generations past has now been revealed unto us so that um, we may be able to uh, fulfill the will of God. So that's my ministry. My ministry is primarily revealing the mind of God. And I'm a part time prophet every now and then. Um, so. God bless you. <laughs> That's an awesome one. Part time. Hmm. Papa, Part-time I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Apostle Charles, please introduce yourself for us. God bless you so much. God bless you. God bless you. We are excited to <laughs> part time. <laughs> That's awesome. 
we are, uh, I am excited to be uh, a part of this uh, segment today. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Chawi Thomas, and um, I am a, a senior pastor of LifeWorks Family Center International right here as well in Columbus, Ohio, uh, pastoring a great, great, great body of a uh, group of people, body of Christ. Uh, my wife and I, Pastor Tara, we are excited to lead such a generation. Yes. I consider myself an end time apostle, pastor, whatever, you know, people have called me prophet, pastor, apostle. Listen, if I'm your friend, that's good enough. <laughs> so, uh, but we just have a heart to serve and uh, just build people, build people, see people delivered, see people saved. Uh, and also we love the prophetic ministry, uh, being able to hear from the Holy Spirit, to be able to tap into the word of knowledge and prophecy and wisdom, divine wisdom, uh, revelation knowledge, and see God's healing uh, take uh, take place in people's lives. And I'm excited to be on here tonight. I'm excited to hear more from Apostle David and Lady Mary. I'm excited. I'm, I'm glad I'm amongst kingdom family. <laughs> God bless you. It, it's, it's awesome. I've had the opportunity to meet both of you and to be in your services and it's a blessing knowing you both. So I also appreciate you for having me, you know, um, always. And whenever I call on you, you are there. So I really do appreciate that. God bless you. All right. So for tonight, um, we are talking about discipline, church discipline. Um, a lot of the pe a lot of people are confused about this whole disciplinary thing. Please, again, I want to emphasize, if you're joining us, please share, share, and share. Someone may have gone through a form of discipline which was not probably received well, or others whom we, someone, sometimes, many of the times when we, someone else is being disciplined, those of us being at the back, you know, tend to also hold it so hard and hold so tight, and we begin to hold offenses and grudges and speak ill and say certain things, you know, about the church, the people of God, the pastors, and all of that. But I say that there's still great amount of God's men and God's women um, in the kingdom that are doing greatly well, you know. And so for those of us who still want to be corrected and disciplined, we are here. But how do we go about it? How it is done is also very important. And so tonight, that is what brings us to this discussion. Um, again, do well to please share. Someone may benefit from tonight's discussion. Before we start, Apostle Judah, uh, I'm going to come to you. Can you, um, what is the simplest way to, to summarize um, excommunication? When someone says excommunication, what is the simplest way to, to summarize that for us? To be ostracized. Mm. Uh, Papa, to, please. Be, mm -hmm. to, be, to be cut off to be cut off a community um, uh, to be removed from among people who think you don't believe or accept um, lay down rules and laws um, mm. that is not so to be excommunicated is to be removed from a group that you usual, uh, you used to identify with based on one or two things it may be it may have gone against guidelines, maybe some people's personal feelings, whatever it is. You are made to feel like you are no, you are no longer part of oh. this group or organization. Hmm. Um, that's the simplest way I can. God bless you. Thank you. Um, Apostle Charles, when, can we sum up church discipline? I mean, we're going to go into it, but church discipline. Yes. Well, the word discipline, you know, you think about the word discipline, you think about disciple. disciple. And discipline is very important because uh, it brings correction. And not only just any type of correction, but it brings the right correction. Mm -hmm. um, and it's out of love. Uh, when you, whenever discipline takes place in, in the body of Christ, it should be led by love. It should not be out of uh, anger, out of spite out of, mm. you know, retaliation mm. or, uh, you know, um, belittling anybody, making someone feel less valued of who they are, but it should be led by love. And so there are times where, you know, discipline is necessary, but I believe how you do it 
is very important as well when dealing with God's people. Thank you so much. So, uh, Apostle Judah, you mentioned something. Is it biblical to have to be excommunicated from amongst a group or a church that which you belong? That's a loaded question, but the the, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, the answer is yes, based on what we are looking at. For example, um, in the Old Testament, when somebody had leprosy, um, and leprosy is a sign of rebellion. When you read the book of Leviticus, it says that if the pulse is white and it has gray hair and it has eaten into the flesh, then the thing is leprosy. So leprosy is a sign of rebellion. We know that because when Moses and, I'm sorry, when Miriam and Aaron uh, rose up against Moses, what broke out on the forehead of Miriam was leprosy. So now when there is a rebellion, God gives us the right to excommunicate rebellion. But when there is a weakness, um, personally, not personally, I don't recommend rebellion when there is a weakness. I recommend uh, um, restoration, rehabilitation. Um, so let's say a pastor spends church money and you try to talk to him and he's not listening, I will apply as communication. Um, a young lady gets pregnant out of wedlock, wedlock, I will apply rehabilitation. So as communication is necessary for some situation and it has to be case by case. I don't think it's one size fits all. Um, Papa, but you mentioned something. You said when there is rebellion and what is the, you made two points, when there's when there rebellion is, and there's weakness. There, no, what, there's, someone would say, what is, what is the difference? That's why I was giving the example that, okay. let's say a pastor have taken church money. And maybe I try to talk to him, hey, pay, pay back the money. And they, they act rebellious, right? That's rebellion, okay. They, they're not fit to lead. Okay. They're not fit to lead. So such a person, um, I'll probably put them to the side. If, if they are not willing to accept um, the rehabilitation program that's laid down for them. Mm. But a young lady gets pregnant, um, or, or somebody makes a mistake, yeah. who apply the rehabilitation process rather than as communication. As communication. So it depends on who, the attitude, they are respond. Um, and like, like Apostle Charles was saying, discipline is a very necessary part of every group, mm -hmm. right? Because when you are a leader, you are tasked to bring the best out of people. And sometimes you don't know who you are dealing with. So the best thing you can have is have a general guidelines. And those general guidelines can be a form of discipline. But it depends on how the person responds to the rules of the, the general guidelines or the doctrines of the church and how you deal with them case by case basis. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to ask um, Apostle Charles, what is the importance of church having church guidelines or having guidelines in the church? Um, I'm picking off what Papa just explained, but what is the importance of it? Because someone is at maybe listening and be thinking, okay, what are the importance of these rules, these, these laws, these guidelines? So can you talk to us? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, guidelines are very important because it teaches order. Uh, the Bible uh, encourages everything that you do, do, let it be done in decency and in order. And order prevents unnecessary chaos. Now, there are times where chaos is needed. You know, God allows it to come. But sometimes uh, order can prevent unnecessary confusion, chaos, discord, uh, disagreement uh, to break out. That way, uh, when you have guidelines, you have, hey, standards, say like for worship leader, you know, if you're a worship leader, uh, we here's our guidelines. We ask that you live holy, you know, uh, you know, we ask that you not uh, be a person who is, you know, struggling with intoxication, uh, you know, your 
uh, that your you know your uh, your pure your uh, sexual you know you're not operating in sexual immorality you know so you have guidelines so that a person understands these are the expectations um, of this said ministry how we operate you know when it comes to being in leadership you know when it comes to serving and so guidelines definitely uh, it sets the standard for order that way anybody who comes to be a part of that church or that ministry hey here's the guidelines if you don't like it hey go 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 down the street you know where they have different guidelines but if you want to be here you have to abide by this this is how we operate we love you um, but in order to you know be considered a leader this is these are the guidelines so it just really in a nutshell it keeps that order um, so that it's things that are in place and in a line within the ministry so in other words, it's really important to also um, have things placed in order, um, just as we have at our jobs and many different places. It is important because sometimes people really have this perception where they think that um, church rules and these things should be like should be flexible. Like it's kind of like, OK, you guys are doing too much. They don't really understand. But I, we, are, we normally say that God is a man of order. And so there has to be an order. If, if I feel like if there should be an order anywhere, it should be done in the house of God. And Papa made an example that if a pastor is, is messing up with church money or if somebody get pregnant and whatnot. But yes, as much as we are human. I think that in the house of God, there has to be order because we are working or we are dealing with the almighty, the supreme, the overall. And so why can there not be an order? Why is it a problem when we come into the things of God, into the kingdom of God, and there is there are rules and regulations, people tend to, hey, you know, it's too much. And you leave um, what you find that people leave one church to the other, one church to the other when they have been disciplined, but you fail to realize that that place that which you are going, there is uh, that place also has their own rules that you have to abide by. And so right. you may be running, but you end up, you cannot run away from God. You come right back under him. So you might be, you might think you're running away from whatever situation that is here or rules and regulations, but you might go to Apostle David's church and those rules might, might even be stricter or might be, you know, it, it might be the same. And so it's just about us understanding the importance of these rules. I think that's where we Christians, we are at now, understanding them and the um, knowing the importance of them. I think that is a key factor for us. Um, you mentioned something, Papa, so let's say, someone is is in our church in our church and the person gets pregnant you know defaulted now when i posted this i received several messages and a gentleman said yeah they do these things but yet they take your money when it's offering time they take your offering <laughs> <laughs> on our whatsapp platform yeah he said well you know they do these things they 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 suspend you they do all these things to you but then when it's time for offering you know you go and and they take your offering but how far do these disciplinary thing how far should they go oh, okay and, so and apostle judah okay go ahead come in and then I ask my question why. I don't know why we make sexual sin the only sin in the church. I was going to get to that. So I wanted to ask you a question first, but if you want to go ahead and chime me, just go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Like, I remember about 13 years ago, I used to lead a youth group. Mm -hmm. And um, we had appointed one of the young ladies to speak at our conference. And then I got wind that she was pregnant, but she didn't tell me directly. And she lived in another state. So I gathered the small money I had at the time and I flew all the way to the state and I had a relationship with her pastor. So when I went to minister at the church, she, she came to see me, she's like, I'm pregnant. You mm. know, I said, your pastor, no? he says, yes. He said, you know, but the church had a policy that when you are pregnant, uh, you, you are suspended or something like that. But Youth Alive at the time was a, was a place for, for the youth to express themselves. So we didn't have such strict rules about mm -hmm. pregnancy. And I was the apostle of the group at the time. So she told me, I said, okay, I'll, I'll talk to your pastor. Then she asked me, 
well, I'm supposed to speak at the conference. Can I still speak? I say, yes, I'm telling you a true story. Um, mm, yeah, we're yeah. on a public platform. I say, yes, you can still speak. But then she said, but I'm pregnant. I said, if you had not, if, the, if you, you had sex, you get pregnant. If you had not gotten pregnant from that sexual act, we would mm. have still let you speak. Yeah. And I said, to discourage people from getting abortions, I will let you speak. Because what happens is that when we shame these people publicly, now when they do something and they get pregnant, yeah, they now want to add sin to yeah. sin. So remember earlier when I spoke about rehabilitation. Yeah. Yes. When I say rehabilitation, I don't mean bringing them up front and shaming them. When somebody has sinned, what we have to do is cover their weakness, right? So what we, what we do with these people is that rather than push them away, the church have to create a system to welcome them, right? We always have to treat these people like Jesus treated the woman who was caught in adultery. Now the church people have brought stones, they were about to stone it because it was in the law of Moses and they coded the church constitution. They said the church constitution says, if a woman is caught in adultery, she should be stoned to death. But what do you say? And lately, um, remember I was saying that uh, I'm an end time apostle. Lately, God is now beginning to reveal the death of his love. And the Holy Spirit said to me some time ago, he says, mankind don't understand how deep I love man. So we go about punishing people based on the righteousness that we have set. And, but who punishes us for our mistakes? Who punishes, who excommunicates us from our lives? Who excommunicates us from breaking guidelines? Now hear me, hear me, I'll reason with me. So let's say we, we, we have a guidelines that says that everybody should come to church at 6 p.m. When you come to church at 7 p.m., have you not broken the guidelines? So how come we let it slide when somebody comes at seven, but then when somebody gets pregnant, we treat them like they have done the worst sin? Or, or, but there are every sin is a sin. That's where we have to begin from. Now, one of the things we have to consider as a church is that from we, the head, all the way down to the bottom, there is nobody that is perfect. We have only been put in charge. Now, if you were a leader, you have been put in charge to bring the best out of people. Now, if they could bring the best out of themselves, we would not have been put in charge. But because they need our guidance. So let's say there are two women in the church, right? The one I've been talking to, stop having sex. Don't do it. Like, I keep telling the same thing to this person. And then there is the other one. I may not have said anything to her. All things because if both of them get pregnant, the one I have been talking to, I will put them on a public blast. But that's going to be my life because I've tried to heal you privately. So some people, until the shame come, they will not change. But maybe the one I've never said anything to, I'm not going to put them on public blast. Why? Because maybe... Uh, um, Maybe it was something they did. Maybe it was just that one time. Maybe, listen, it's not everybody that has not gotten pregnant in the church that's not having sex. That's right. I can, I can guarantee you there are more people having sex in the church yeah. that has not gotten pregnant than there are those who get pregnant. Yeah. And just because somebody has gotten pregnant out of wedlock doesn't mean that they are evil or they are sinful or anything. It may have been they think they are in love. So the rehabilitation program has to be very important. Um, okay. I, I personally use excommunication or suspension or yabawas and whatever thing. I use it as a last resort. Okay. When there is no other ways for the person to respond to rehabilitation, then I use suspension as a last resort. Thank I you so much. That. Papa, finish up. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I said, but we do have that. That okay. I use that, but it's, it's that has to it's be the last used. option. The it's like after you option. after you've exhausted every exhausted every every everything. okay because sure. discipline is still needed. Apostle problem. Charles. 
um, Papa took my words out of my mouth before I could ask my question. But, you know, he said that we make sex the only type of sin. But I normally say there's that lady or there's that man who seems to know everything about that person that comes to visit the church. There's that one person in the church who knows, who seems to know every issue that <laughs> that's happened. And um, so, uh, some way, somehow, they are kind of hurting the church because every person that comes, she has something to say about them. He has something to say about them. You know, their attitude, their demeanor, their reception to people and things like that in the church is poor. And people complain but this same person has not been suspended because it's not the act of sex y am i making sense and so i want you to touch on that how how should people really relate to that because mind you i've had people come to me and said this person does that somebody even mentioned something that they had an experience in one of the churches and right here in columbus and it's as if they, are, they were playing favoritism because that which she was suspended for, she knows very well that the pastor's daughter was doing the same thing. So how do we really deal with such, you know, these, because there's so many, so many different sins that it seems like we capitalize on the sex part. Please come in. I, I love, you know, I love the word of God and the word of God gives us everything we need to know. I, um, Galatians 6 and 1, it says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, Ye who are spiritual, restore yes. such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest you also be tempted. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell me? If we we can't pick and choose <laughs> what we want to, you know, kick people out of the church for. Listen, if we were not in the ministry of restoration, everybody should be sat down. Everybody. <laughs> from the from the oh, apostle to the bishop to the prophet to the evangelist to the missionary to the visionary it, listen everybody sit down everybody sit down because we we the uh, jesus said in the new testament if you even lust after a woman you have already committed the act so guess what if we had to go through everything and say oh you thought about sex oh you already did it and everybody sitting down. Listen, here's here's how we do it. You know, it, from I, from a personal standpoint, how I've dealt with it, um, I, I only operate in restoration. You know, when a person now there's here here's where we um, someone had asked a question: um, Is it biblical to excommunicate someone? Well, if you read uh, Matthew the 18th chapter. Uh, the 15th through the 18th verse that will let you know how you do it if a person is uh in sin you go to them you know the leader the pastor you go to them hey i hear you're having issues i see you're having issues what's going on are you okay i've done this personally i've gone to people one-on-one -on -one. are you okay are you you know is this is this was this a mistake or is this a lifestyle that you now want to live? That's, those are two different things. There's an act of sin, then there's a sinful lifestyle. And we have to know the difference. Um, the Bible talks about if, you know, it says uh, you go to them in private. If they're in yes. sin, go to them in private. If they listen to you, you have won them. You have won them. But if they don't listen to you, you bring somebody else with you. Mm -hmm. You take yeah. two or more people with you and then you talk to them again but if they still don't receive it if they still don't receive correction the bible says this is the new testament it says to treat them like a gentile or tax collector in other words uh, this person has made up in their mind that i am comfortable in this sinful lifestyle i'm not right now i'm not living for christ so they have now in that moment made their own decision where they want to be, you know, here, here, here's what I say, um, you know, uh, here's how I've dealt with things. You know, I, I, I first approach it with love restoration, you know, Hey, can, is it, there's something we can pray about? Is this, is this something you want to overcome? First of all, because 
as a as a leader, man, you have to you have to know um, what that person wants. Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to be healed from this? Do you want to be set free from this this struggle? And there's a difference, you know. And so, but if a person is you know in wickedness and they're coming to the church, they're they're spreading gossip. They're trying to sleep with everything that got two legs in the church. You know, you have your God given right and authority to separate them uh, from that church, knowing that their purpose and motive is to come into the house of God and spread discord. You have a God given right to do that. Because guess what? When you go on your job and you harassing people, guess what? They have stuff in place where you you can be terminated, you know. But I think I think we've gotten this notion in the church that God is nicer than our boss, so we can do whatever we want in the church. It's the grace, <laughs> the, the grace of God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's nicer than my boss, you know. Yeah. Oh, God understand? No, 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 no. The Old Testament, we should be glad that uh, God hit, uh, left it up to the church how to deal with people because in the old testament god dealt with it himself mm -hmm. listen he gave you 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 had leprosy like apostle david said folks dropped dead remember when uh matter of fact even in the new testament peter had asked uh ananias and sophia what did you do with the offering what did you do with the money they both lied to him and guess what happened they dropped dead the husband lied he dropped dead his wife came in, she lied, she dropped dead. And so thank God for discipline because I'd rather deal with discipline than deal with God. <laughs> so I like that. <laughs> rather rather deal with discipline because God's wrath. Of course, we all know, right? The wrath of God. And who wants to deal with it? <laughs> who wants to deal with it? So I really, I really like that. Thank you so much for that. Apostle David, I'm coming back to you. The gentleman question that he asked, he's he's listening, so I'm gonna ask this question for him. He says, so he feels like when you are excommunicated or when you're disciplined, when you're suspended, then your offering should not be taken. Another thing is in some churches, you are put in the back seat. So if at first, if you're able to sit up front, you're no longer, um, you no longer can sit up front. So these are his questions. And I want you both to chime in, Apostle David. So why is it that when I'm excommunicated, my offering is still taken? And why am I also not allowed to sit in the front seat? Please come in. Come on. Come in Early on, I spoke when I was saying that Paul said, the things that was hidden from the generations past has now been revealed unto us. Um, if you look at the way the world is going, you can tell that the mindset of each generation is different, right? And Paul said that all scriptures are given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and they are good for doctrines. So you can see that in this current generation, that's not the way we deal with people. Generations are cyclical. What I have realized that in the past, those methods work. The shaming methods work. And all of that is nothing but to make you feel bad so that it will serve as deterrent to others. So if I'm, a, if I'm being a deterrent to others, then my money should also be deterrent to others. But then this is the thing. We are at the point whereby God is revealing his love in the greater way. And it is very hypocritical of the church to say, you sin, sit at the back of the corner. How about the sins that we don't see? Then in the book of Romans, he said, who are you to be another man, uh, uh, to judge another, another man's servant? And we know that God is the only omni omniscient that sees all. We see limited ones. So if we are punishing people or shaming them for the sins that we see, how about the ones that we don't see? We are taking too much greater authority upon ourselves. So what I would say is this is old school, that is past. We, I spoke to somebody, I said the church, uh, I said that Christianity is scientific. 
um, develop hypothesis, test your hypothesis. Uh, if you yield the same results over and over again, then you have, uh, uh, then you have what the science. We have tested that hypothesis, it doesn't work. What we have realized is that it drives away people from God. It is not people's responsibility to change. It is our responsibility to pull out that change out of them. We have to pull it out. And the method that works for brother A may not work for brother B because human beings are not homogeneous. We all have our different personalities. Sure. And it is the lazy way of pastoring the church. It is a very, very lazy way. Mm. The best way is that love those who cannot be loved. And I agree with what Pastor Charles was saying. There are some people you can see that they are in the church to cause trouble and confusion. Now, the word, the Greek word that we receive as a pastor in the Hebrew means a shepherd. And you know how David says, thou anoint my head with oil? It's, he has a spiritual side, but he has a natural side also. Back in those days, the shepherd would take the sheep and he would check the sheep for fleas, make sure that there are no fleas. And the oil treats the sheep for the fleas, right? So we, the shepherd, the pastor, either you are apostle, evangelist, prophet, whatever, your primary job is a pastor to care for the people. Our job is to check the sheep for fleas. You don't cast away a sheep when it's maim or hurt, you try to treat it. You, you, you know, and our attitude as pastors is what has permeated through the church members. So if you have church people who are judgmental, check yourself first, because your church members are the product of what you teach them. I should be careful of saying this. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Your church members are the. Let me give you an example. Like one day. A guy came to the church, he was all tattooed up. And he sat next to some of the members and they became afraid. And I told them, I said, this is what I'm talking about. God is sending people with piercings, with tattoos and this, this. The church is not a place where we come to show off our clothes every Sunday. It's a place where God is going to send in those who are broken so that we can mm, fix them. Yes. Not the yeah. pastor, we can yeah. fix them. So it's now the pastor's job and his responsibility to teach the church members that we are in the business of restoration, rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitation and fixing people. And if a church is functioning right, I should not have a member for more than five years who cannot disciple somebody. If we are functioning right, if the church should be a recycling place. You get them, you impact them, you release them, they go do their thing, you take on new people. You impact them, you take them. That's how you grow. You, you grow by impacting people. But what are you impacting? You're not going to, if the church is for perfect people, then we might as well shut down. But he said, go ye into the world, preach the gospel. There must be a standard, right? But the, the standard must be flexible. It, it must be very flexible. And the flexibility of the standard must be grace, love, and mercy. Yes, we have rules. Just like they have rules when they brought the lady. But Jesus said, he that is without sin has the first time. I'm glad I'm hearing, Pastor Charles. There are new generations that God is raising. I believe yeah. we are in that Jeremiah season when he said, I will give you pastors according yeah. to my heart. Desire, my heart. Who shall feed you? So right now, we don't want to be kings. We don't want to be bishops. We don't want to. We just want to serve the people of God. We just want to serve those who are. Yeah. So if you are in your church and they have excommunicated, come to 1850 Woodland Avenue who accept you and, and work with you. God bless you. Apostle Charles, please chime in on, on my question for me. Could you, could you restate it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why I was saying that I, I know Pastor David has said a lot, but I still want you to chime in. The gentleman said <clears throat> we we excommunicate people, yet we take their offering. And then some churches okay. excommunicate you and then they'll, they'll, you're no longer allowed to sit in the front of the church. You have to sit like way back. And there are some where your offering, you actually have to give your offering to someone to place in the offering bowl for you. And he's saying that why, if you're, if you're excommunicating me, if you're taking me, or if you're suspending me, then why should my offering be accepted? And why should I even be um, 
not allowed to sit in front of the church. Please go ahead. Wow, I, that's actually new to me. I've never heard of that. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of that. Um, wow, I, I think um, that's a very important question because uh, we live in a day and time where money has been one of the one of the passions and a lot of the motives of ministry um, nowadays. It's no, it, it really hasn't been souls. It hasn't been, you know, saving the lost. It hasn't been advancing the kingdom. It has been for the love of money, you know, for the mighty dollar. And a lot of people will accept your money over you. And that's sad. And that should not be. And I and I I'm, I, I apologize to any person. And I serious I seriously sincere with sincerity apologize to any person who has been, uh, your money has been more accepted than you. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. Um, because uh, a person's soul is more important than any amount of money that they could ever give into the church. And so I've never dealt with that, but uh, a person giving to the church should not make uh, you know any leader compromise on or water down any truth that they're teaching. Um, one thing I love about God's word is you don't have to remember what you said because it's true. It's God's word. You don't have to argue it. You don't have to, uh, you know, uh, it's God's word. God's word is going to stand. It's going to remain. It said prophecy will pass away. Gifts will pass away. But the word of God will remain. And as long as you are teaching the word of God, you can get mad. If you want, you can get upset with your pastor or your, your bishop because they're telling the truth. But guess what? Don't stop teaching the truth. If, if, if somebody threatens me and says, hey, I'm going to stop giving because you 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 talking against my sin that I like. Then, hey, take your money. Yeah. And yeah. Take, take yourself and go find somewhere where they're going to water down the word of God, where, where you and all those devils will be comfortable. You can you can go there. But as long as long as you're here, yeah. we're gonna tell the truth, and we're gonna get them devils out of your life. That's what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna get you free, if you want it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Apostle David says something earlier that's so powerful. You can't make people do something they don't want to do. You can't. You can't change people. They have to want to change, and mm -hmm. you have to be willing to give it. Uh, we live in a day and time where we have pastors who are not pastors they got yeah. hurt in church and they yeah. wanted to start their own ministry yes. and now you can see the results of it on how they deal with the people they don't they're a sunday pastor mm. they, they they only pastor when people come to the church mm -hmm. they only pastor when they're preaching behind the pulpit they only they don't they don't they don't give their number out to their members they don't meet with them one-on-one -on -one. they don't listen to what they're going through it's all about them being heard. They want to be a superstar preacher on Sunday, mm. but in but in private, they're pitiful. Mm. Matter of fact, the same sin that they've been preaching against, they're living it they're behind living closed it. doors. Mm. And that's why you have preachers who can still accept money from people who are hurt and they're downtrodden. Their soul, they're on their way to hell. And all you care about is the money. Did you pay your tithe? what listen listen god is not pleased with that we uh god is raising up pastors who love the people i you know i, I i've been around pastors who don't like people they they said it out of their mouth oh i can't stand these people I, <laughs> you are in the wrong ministry you are in the wrong because reason. pastoring means you love people yeah if you don't love people if they get on your nerves, if you upset because they not showing up, if you upset because listen, who who did God give the ministry? Yeah. Who did God tell to go birth that ministry? He told you. So stop getting worked up and downtrodden because the people aren't listening. Are you listening as the leader? My God, I didn't got. I'm sorry, I didn't got started here. No, that's fine. Oh, that's man. that's that's so that's that's <laughs> that's so all right. You know, my my husband said something to me years ago. Um, I was having a conversation with him, and then he said, um, "Let me tell you, my dear, 
salvation is more important than paying your tithe. Initially, I didn't understand that. But as I, as time went by, you know, as I got closer to the Lord, I realized that it is true because if somebody is saved, truly, you would not need to force them. You would not need to turn, you know, like kind of, um, what you is the word? You trick them. You don't need to trick them. Yeah. He, he, he said Praise salvation is more important than, than tight. I, 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 I was kind of struggling to understand that because I'm like, no, you have to pay your tithe. You have to pay your tithe. But then as time went by, I understood that, yes, wait, what he said is true. If I am saved, if I have come to understand, there is that natural burden that comes where you will begin to understand the things of God, the principles and how to go about things where you don't need to be forced. You don't need to be tricked. You don't need to be told, Hey, this person is standing behind you. This person is running after you for even for you to even sow seeds or, or do anything like that. So these are really great points that you, you both, you both have made. I, I, I appreciate your comments. Pastor Charles, you wanted to say something, please, before I move on. S some of the, some of the things that you guys are sharing, we've never experienced in our ministry. So mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, because um, uh, I don't allow people to come to our ministry uh, mm -hmm. and preach and they use tactics to get people to give. I, we, sure. we don't do that. Sure. Sure. We, don't, we don't allow that. We will shut it down. We will mute your mic. We will, matter of fact, some, and I'm, and I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna shut up and we gonna move on. Some of these preachers and leaders, they need to be excommunicated. They need yeah, to be I think kicked I out of the church. I thought David said that from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these tactics and gimmicks, you listen, they need to be kicked out of the church. They trying to kick out folks who struggling and need Jesus. And you've been preaching, uh, 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 you know, saying what I need to do and, 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 and do this and you not even living it. So I, mm. I want to make this point too. What I believe one of the reasons even the Bible it mentions yes it, it it speaks against all sin uh but what one of the one of the most important sins when it comes to the church is uh, uh sexual immorality and the reason why that's mentioned a lot and that's a reason why maybe a lot of people use that you know and they target that area is because sexual immorality is, is not only are you sinning against God, but you're sinning against your own body. And, and it separates you. Now, sins like lying and, you know, pride, God hates those sins. You know, he hates those sins. You're sinning against God. But when a person is uh, uh, in the act of sexual immorality, not only are they sinning against God, but they are sinning against themselves. Um, David, for instance, in the Old Testament, when he was running from King Saul, he went into the house of shoe bread with the consecrated bed, the, the, the hollow bread, the holy bread. The, the only question that the high priest had asked him, he didn't say, have you been lying? He didn't say, have you been stealing? He said, have you and your men kept yourself from the women? That was the only uh, check system that he had. He didn't ask him about lying or stealing. He asked him about sexual purity, sexual immorality. Why? It's because the bread that they were getting ready to eat was consecrated. And what, oh my God. And he, and he understood that sexual immorality is a soul tie. It's one of the only sins that just, that doesn't only involve you, but it involves everybody else that you have been involved with. So you now have a soul tie. So whoever you have been in sexual immorality with, a part of their soul is now tied to you. And that's and that's why even in First Corinthians, um, uh, the fifth chapter, Romans, the 16th chapter, it, it, it deals with uh, immorality, sexual immorality. And, and but it's not the only sin. Right. It's not the only sin, but it's one of those sins where. It, 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 it involves more than just you. And that's what makes it uh, 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 more of an importance when it comes to holiness, when it comes to um, carrying the call of God on your life, you know, um, because you're sinning against your own body. And in mm -hmm. Romans, it says, present your bodies yeah. a living sacrifice. sacrifice. 
holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I just wanted to chime in on that part because That's I know fine. that was brought out too. So That's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing conversation. If anybody wants to um, um, say anything at all, please, again, 1-614-592-8351 if you have a contribution or if you want to ask the man of God any question, 1-614-592-8351. If you're on Facebook, you can input your question under the live. And if you're on Zoom, you can just enter your question in the chat box. Someone said, there are pastors who will love you today, but at the least mistake, they will give up on you completely. Sometimes it's not even that you have done anything bad, but someone gossiped about you and boom, you know, you are left alone and they, they want nothing to do with you. Wow, it's been an amazing conversation. We're gonna have a part two because one hour is already up. Can you believe it's an hour already? Wow. Yeah, it's an hour. We have uh, when the conversation is good. I mean, so much information is being poured out, but I'm really glad that it's been clear that discipline, um, as communication, these are all biblical and uh, they're like grounds. They ground us as a way, you know, kind of it grounds you so that. I guess you could do well, you know, it, it kind of cautions you, I guess, so to speak. Um, it, it feels good when you're able to walk right with God, you know, when you are living in sin and doing all sorts of things. Honestly, when you're even alone, you and the slightest thing, you begin to look over your shoulder, turn around, you know, because you think someone is probably listening in or running after you. But meanwhile, that's not even the case. Before we end our, our session, let me just quickly look on Facebook. I'm not sure if there are any questions on there. I'm not sure if there's any questions on Facebook. It's just a whole a lot of um, good comments and contributions um, going on here on Facebook. So we have four minutes. Apostle David. Yes. What will be your final words for us concerning our topic for today? Oh. I, I believe many God called us. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and I said that intercessors are important mm -hmm. because when God is about to be angry with mankind, he looked for a man and he allowed that man to change his wrath, his mind, his heart. Um, and that's why we are raised as pastors. When you read the book of Numbers, there was the death of plague coming upon the people. And God told Aaron to, uh, Moses told Aaron to bring the golden censer in the Bible said, and Aaron stood between the dead and the living, holding the golden censer. That is our job as pastors, to stand between God and humanity. And whenever God wants to bring his wrath, he remembers us saying, Father, give it one more year. Jesus spoke about the parable, and he says that there was a, there was a tree, um, and it was not yielding fruit, and the master came, and he said, cut it down. And the caretaker said, Lord, give me one more year. Let me try. Then, so that is the job of a pastor. The pastor is we standing in the gap saying, God, just give them one more chance. Um, so we are raised to stand in the gap. We are not raised to be judges. We are not raised to condemn people, but rather we are raised so that when the wrath of God is coming, he will look upon the heart that we have for the people. And it reminds God that his love is a seed. And the Lord said to Moses, leave me alone so that I will destroy these people. God is more powerful than Moses. But he raised Moses on purpose. He knew that Moses was that kind of man that when he's about to be angry to destroy the people, Moses will remind him so that the people will not say, you know, you're not powerful enough to save them. That's why you brought them here to destroy them. And he said, God repented. Now, sometimes God is punishing people because we tell him to punish them. Sometimes the wrath of God is coming upon people because we tell them to. But if we keep telling God, have mercy upon this person, God does. The kingdom of Saul lasted for 40 years 
because Samuel interceded for him for 25 years. He spoke to him and he said, the Lord has rejected you. But yet he kept interceding for him. Therefore, he was able to be on the throne for another 25 years. Men and women of God, let us be patient with the people of God, for we are raised to stand in the gap for them. When God gives you a church full of stubborn people, then he trusts you. When he gives you a church full of easy people, he doesn't trust you. So, so <laughs> amen. Let me yield the rest of my time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my <laughs> God. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Apostle Charles, <laughs> okay, your, your gonna, final words for us. Today. I love that, Pastor. I love that. Um, my final words would be: I wanna, I wanna speak um, healing to just mm -hmm. over anybody who's been through church hurt. You know, uh, you you've been um, under shepherd. You know, you've been heavy shepherd. Uh, you've you've been under leadership that tried to control you by the spirit of manipulation and witchcraft, word curses, and they spoke negative things concerning your life. I wanna speak freedom and healing over you uh, this evening. And I declare and I cancel any uh, attachment of, of anything that was uh, done to you, uh, any abuse, sexual abuse by leadership, any lies that were told to you, any uh, 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 vex, vexations and things and incantations that were spoken over you because they try to control you. Well, I speak freedom of Jesus Christ over you tonight, that you would be free to walk in the peace and love of God so that you can begin to live on the purpose that God has given you. And from this day on, we remove that guilt and shame off of you. We remove that off of you by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. You no longer have to carry that burden on you anymore. Jesus Christ sets you free right now in Amen. Jesus name. We speak peace and freedom over you. We speak the love of Christ over you. He went to the cross for you. He took on the world on his shoulders for you. You don't have to live in that shame anymore. You don't have to live in that guilt anymore. You don't have to live in that defeat anymore. By the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost, we speak freedom over every chain that's been attached and latched to you, we break it tonight, right now, by the blood of Jesus over your life. We come against any generational curses, any anything that the enemy has tried to stick on you, we remove it right now. We burn it with the fire of the Holy Ghost on your life. We thank you right now. And I just speak uh, peace to you. Um, if you. If you've fallen, get back up. You know, Jesus is married to the backslider and his love will give you the strength to slide back under his love, under his wing, under his new covenant that says you don't have to go through all those hoops. Call on the name of Jesus, ask for forgiveness, walk in your repentance and experience the true freedom of Jesus Christ on your life. God bless you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on here tonight. God bless you. Amen. Nice to it's, meet you, Jay. It's been an you amazing well. night. Listen, um, yeah, I, I personally want to have a part two. It's been a blessing to Let's me. Let's do it. Let's um, do it. God Let's bless do it. you both so much. Um, very informative. Very informative. And I'm glad and honored that you both um, honored our invitation tonight. To everyone who came late, please, you can go back and look, um, have a replay of tonight's um, discussion and it will be um, beneficial. It will be of a benefit to you. The Lord bless you all so much. we we'll see you next week, God willing. God bless you. Bye, Apostle David and bye, bye Apostle Charles. God bless you both. Thank, bless thank, you. You, thank you, Lady Mary, for the opportunity. Papa, thank you, Papa. Thank you, thank you. Nice to meet you, Mother of God. You as well. We'll talk soon.
Lord, I pray you are. 